anymore. So let's see the Bibles. Word. <laughs> Word. Okay, what else are we going to show? Pens. Pens. If you, if, you, if you have a bulletin, there is space in your bulletin for notes, and that's what you use your pen for. Turn to Acts chapter 13. How many people here are from San Diego State? Please raise your hand. We can just see you. Great, great. How many people from here from in any college? Raise, just any college. All right. Good. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we just thank you, and uh, you're so good to us. Lord, I pray someone tonight would let you be good to them your way. They would stop trying to do things their way. They would let you be good your way. Challenge us. Help us to face our fears. Help us to overcome those obstacles that are preventing us from obeying you. And we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, have two young lady friends who are beach volleyball players, and they, they are ranked number one in the country. They're going to the Olympics in about a week and a half, and they were here this weekend to play the beach tournament down at um, Mariner's Point. So we went down and saw them yesterday, and they won their first game 15 to 1. Uh, I know I was like, you know, ugh. And uh, then they won the next game, I don't know, 15 to 8 or whatever. And so I, I wanted to go this morning. They were playing today. They had like three or four games today. So I, I got up this morning, you know, and did my five hours of prayer from 1 to five, one to 6, and then went jog and lifted weights, did all that stuff, you know, this morning. And <laughs> but actually, I went running this morning. Then I went down to the bay, and uh, I'm actually sitting in the stands, and someone comes up to me and says, are you going to church this morning? I said, yeah, I got my clothes in the car. She says, I got my clothes in the car, too. It's like, if I, you're not going, I'm not going. But I said, no, I'm going, I'm going. So uh, I get to the match, and is, when I first got there, and their names are um, Annette Davis and Jenny, Jordan, uh, Jenny Johnson Jordan. And, and so you'll see them. They're going to sit. They're ranked two. The Brazil team is ranked number one in the world. So uh, they're going to be up there. Uh, and, and their believers love God. They're both their husbands love God. And, uh, but anyway, I'm sitting in there. And I get to the stands, and it's about 10 of 9. And the match was at 9. And there were about 10 people in the stands, basically all their family and friends, no one, pretty much one or two other people. So the match starts, and, and they were playing a team that beat them last week. These two ladies, were, they were awesome. And so the match started, and, you know, it's one nothing, one one two one two two three. You know, just we're going on. I'm going, you know, I, I don't know the, uh, uh, in, in, in volleyball they say side out. I still haven't figured out what that means, but I just hear everybody else saying it, so I say it. Side out, you know. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of got juvenile and just said, get another point. You know, that's, that was my cheer. I just get basic, you know. So I'm, I'm not cheering, though, a lot. I'm just kind of watching the thing. You know, I'm waiting for them to pull away and whoop these girls, right? But these girls are whooping. I mean, these girls started winning. They basically were winning. The other team was winning the whole time. Well, what happens about a quarter of the way when it was like, you know, four or five points, the other girls, one of them's into tie-dye stuff. And so she had about six people come at one time, guys and mostly guys, with all this tie-dye clothes on. And they sat right in the front row of these bleachers in the middle of the court. So they were in front of me a little to my left. And every time their girl scored a point, they were like, yeah, yeah. and I was like, oh, it's going to be like that. <laughs> because, you know, when, you, when you're rooting for somebody and other people rooting it and, and they score against you and they start yelling, it's like you take it personal. At least I do. You take it personal? I take it personal. So I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, you, ain't, you ain't yelling. That's my girls over there. Yeah. So every time they scored a point on my friends, it looked, they made it look ugly by screaming. So I was like, nah. So we started yelling. I, at least I started yelling louder. And they were in front of me, and, you know, I'm yelling. They never turned around, but I was looking at the back of them because I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, we're here too, you know. And so, the whole, I mean, it was, I was so nervous. I wasn't nervous in the beginning, but once the, this competition 
started going, then I was like, okay, now things are on the line. I got to, this has now become a, a, a confrontation. And so now it's like nine, eight, and we're losing the whole time. It gets to be 13, 11, we're losing. And I'm like, no, we're going to the Olympics. We ain't losing this match. Okay, so bam, bam. I mean, they were spiking on each other's heads and dumping in the sand, getting sand in the, I mean, it was awesome. And they're yelling, I'm yelling, they're yelling, I'm yelling. And then we ended up winning 15 to 13. Uh, but the whole time, the first, at the first, it was just a nice little game of volleyball. Then it got into this confrontation. When you ask Christ to be your Savior and Jesus sends you out to do his ministry, and what does that mean? Everybody who's saved has a ministry. Not full-time like me. You have a mission from God, okay? God has something for you to do. He has somebody for you to talk to, somebody you one day to confront in love with the truth. That's a given. But a lot of times people get saved. They say, I don't want a confrontation. I don't want to make enemies. I don't want to be one of those holy roller fanatics. I'm just going to be a good person. No, there are no good people. You're not good. Your job is to be obedient. And if you are obedient, people are going to get ruffled. That's the nature of the gospel. The gospel is a stumbling block. The gospel says some are going to heaven and some are going to hell. That's bad news. Any way you cut it, you can't be like, hell, you know, you're a really good person. You're going to go to hell, but it's not going to be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Hell's going to be bad. Hell's going to be bad. And in this story we're going to look at, well, last week we talked about being a G5 Christian. Okay, if you weren't here, get the CD. But we're looking at G5 Christian Part 2, Chapter 13. Let's look at a couple of facts in the beginning. Chapter 13 of Acts, verse 2, it says, They ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, Separate to me Barnabas and Saul. What was Saul's name changed to? Everybody say Paul. The Apostle Paul's name was Saul originally, and God changed his name to Paul. And then it says, it says, separate to me Paul, Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. You need to know the work God has called you to. And you need to know the work God has not called you to. You need to know. God wants to separate you to himself for a specific work. Then look at verse 4. Then being sent out. By the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. God wants to do this. He wants to separate you from your old mindset, your old crowd possibly, your old habits, and then send you to do something for him. When he separates you and sends you, you now belong to him. You belong to him. I belong to God. I don't belong to anybody else. I belong to God. And the more I learn that and the more I allow my belongingness to be complete, the more I'm going to do exactly what he wants me to do. And the more fruit's going to be in my life. Now, fruit is people getting saved and fruit is people getting ticked because the gospel just got under their skin. Okay? Paul preaches the gospel. We're not going to read it, but it's starting in verse 13 all the way to verse 41. Uh, he preaches the gospel, and here's what he tells these Jewish men. The Jews were in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. They were delivered. They walked 40 years in the desert. God gave them judges and kings, David, Solomon, Samuel, Saul, prophets, and ever, et cetera. He gave them Jesus, and through Jesus Christ, there's forgiveness of sins. Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and if you repent of your sin, he will forgive you. Paul lays out the gospel, the same old gospel. There's only one, same gospel. Now, in this crowd, some of the Jews and the Greeks, they accept it, but some of them don't. That's not Paul's problem. Paul's problem is I need to say it clearly. I need to say it intelligently. I need to say it biblically, and I need to say it in love. If it bothers you, that's not my problem. As long as I say it intelligently, accurately, and in love. You could tell someone right to their face, you know what? God loves you so much. And he wants to forgive you of your sin, but you need to repent because you're a sinner. And then go, oh, man, really? How do I get saved? I was in the airport a month ago. I can't remember. And I was sitting in the airport. It was like 7 o'clock in the morning. I just know I was mad because I did not want to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. And this lady, <laughs> there's nobody there. 
And this lady is walking. She's like way over there. And she's looking, looking. And the guy that was with me, he saw her looking. And she comes walking right over. You know what she says? Are you Miles? I said, yes. Yeah. I go to the church. Da, 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 da. She says, I want to be saved. Right there. I want to be saved. I said, you come to the right place. Let's sit down right here. <laughs> she says, I'm on break. I said, I mean, I'm at work. Take a break. This is only going to take a second. Some people hear the message and they get saved. We had a guy at the small groups in the homes that we have all around the county. People getting saved. They're bringing their friends getting saved. One pastor told me a guy came to his small group and they said to the pastor, can you pray for this guy? They brought him outside. He says, what can I pray for? He says, I want to get saved. He's like, that's it? Some people hear the gospel and they want it. And some people hear the gospel and they get mad. You mean you're telling me I'm a sinner? You mean to tell me I'm not a good person? You, you mean to tell me I'm going to hell? You don't have to go to hell. But if you want to cop an attitude, yes, <laughs> you're going to go to hell. <laughs> Your situation is to share the gospel. What we're going to read is about five things that are going to happen to you if you are going to be committed. These five things you have to accept as part of the deal. Okay? Let's read it. Verse uh, 44. Let's read this real quick. 44. Acts 13, 42. It's 44. It says, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Everybody say envy. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Say opposed. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word should be spoken to you first. But since you caught an attitude and judge yourselves unworthy... To everlasting life, behold, we go to the Gentiles. Verse 47, so the Lord commanded us, saying, I've set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God. And as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. And the word of God spread. But, verse 50, the Jews who didn't believe stirred up devout and prominent women and raised chief and the chief men of the city and raised up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas. Everybody say the word envy. Say the word opposed. Say the word stirred. Say judge yourself unworthy. And say the word persecution. First thing, persecution. Stuff is going to happen to you. People will talk about you, make fun of you, spread lies about you, gossip about you, hate you. It's going to happen. Look, Let me read a verse to you, John 15, 20. Jesus said, remember the word I spoke to you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. This is our memory verse for the week in our small groups. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. This to me is Jesus saying, duh. Stuff happens to you. You go, oh, how could this happen? How could they treat me like this? I'm a good person. Jesus says, duh. They did it to me. I healed the blind, the deaf, the mute. I raised the dead, healed the crippled, healed the sick. And they killed me. You got your one little weak verse, and you think they shouldn't do anything to you? You're like, Jesus loves you. <laughs> I mean, I was God. I walked on water, and they killed me. So you, duh, if they're doing something to you. I mean, verse, 1 Peter 4.12 says, beloved, listen to this. This is so amazing. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. As though some strange thing was happening. Don't think it like, what's going on? It says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Rejoice that you're part of the team now. Whenever I would play football as a kid, my favorite atmosphere was a night game on a field that you can get mud. Like, you know. It was dirty, and it was humid where you would sweat and get funky and, you know, just get, you know, just, that's like the best. And so we, you know, you would hate to come out of a game clean. If you were clean after the game, you were a scrub. You didn't play. You didn't, and if you played, you didn't do anything. You had to come out blood somewhere, mud somewhere, you know, stuff broken, 
That, hey, you play. You want to walk off the field like this. Yeah, I play. You don't want to walk off the field, you know, try, hey, ladies, how you doing? Yeah, I just had a rough game. And they look at you like, how come you're not dirty? Well, you know, no one hit me. I was just so, so elusive, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. We used to have guys on our team that didn't play, and what they would do is right before the end of the game, when they realized they really weren't getting in, because they kind of thought they were, but we could have told them they weren't, they would go behind the bench and get mud and just wipe it on their jerseys, <laughs> make it look like they played. You don't want to go to heaven having no war stories. You don't want to go to heaven and see John the Baptist, he got his head cut off. Now, I'm sure they're going to put it back. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he's not going to be walking around like this, you know. But he got his head cut off. He will have, I, I don't know, I don't know how they, he may have the Frankenstein thing. I don't know. But he's gonna, he got his head cut off. John the apostle got boiled in oil. Isaiah got cut in half. James got his head cut off. Peter got hung upside down, crucified upside down. These guys went through some stuff. And you don't want to go there and see these men of faith saying, here are the scars of my faith. This is what I went through because I defended Christ. And you walk in all pretty, but you're a little, oh, here I am, I've arrived. And they look at you and say, what kind of faith did you live? You know, you want to go to heaven and say, man, I fought the good fight. God sits you down and shows you the fruit of your life. Some of y'all, he's going to show you a video. It's going to be real short. Sit down, I want to show you a video. It's only going to take a minute because you really didn't do anything for me. <laughs> okay, Gabriel, run the video. <laughs> There's one guy in the video walking around going like this. <laughs> That's your whole ministry right there, that one guy. Sad thing is that that guy is you. You're the only guy that got saved. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to be that guy. You want to be the guy to go in and say, man, I made it. I fought. I struggled, I preached, I got ridiculed, I got, got talked about, I got wronged, wronged, because I was walking with Jesus. If you think that your life is fruitful because you're not getting confrontation, you got it backwards. If the devil ain't coming against you, guess what? He's probably walking with you. You're probably the biggest sucker in the world. The devil got his arm around you. Yeah, go ahead. Don't bring your Bible. You, you cool. Just be cool. Go late, okay? Don't go early. You don't want to look like some, you know, God freak or nothing like that, you know. <laughs> Ladies don't like people with Bibles. Just sit in the back, cross your arms. Don't, don't pray for nobody. You don't want people. To... That's you. Devil got you right where he wants you, Pat. you on the head. Good little boy. Now go home. Don't say your prayers. You don't need to. Miles said it for you. Go ahead home. <laughs> That's what the devil's telling you. Oh, yeah, you know, whatever Miles said, God, amen. <laughs> it don't work that way. My prayers ain't good for you. You got to say your own prayers. You got to say, listen, I'm not worried about being persecuted. I'm not worried about being laughed at. I'm not worried about being talked about. I'm not worried about people stabbing me in the back. You know why? Because God got my back. You stab me once, God's going to bless me twice. So go ahead and stab me. Persecution. Look what it says in verse 44. 44. Envy. When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Everybody say envy. envy. Say envy. envy. Jealousy, greed, resentment. You're too blessed. You're too blessed. You ever see those Christians? Everything's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How you doing? Oh, everything's going bad. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. You hate that? You shouldn't. You should say, you know what? I want that. But people who hate Jesus hate that. They don't want you to be blessed. Because if you're blessed, then it proves somehow that your God is true. Envy. Matthew 27, 17, it says, therefore, this is when Jesus was being crucified. Therefore, when they gathered together, Pilate, Pontius Pilate said, whom do you want me to release? Barabbas, the criminal, or Jesus, the Christ? For Pilate knew that they handed him over because of envy. All the high and mighty religious... Praise God, Jehovah God. The, the Jewish guys, the Pharisees, Pharisee meant separated one. They wouldn't hang out with common folk like us. They couldn't get the people to follow them. They couldn't get the people to believe because they, they, were, they were hypocrites. 
Jesus came and ministered to people, poor people, all the people that the religious people didn't want to be around. He went and loved them, encouraged them, taught them, received them. And they started following him. And they got jealous, envious. Man, who does he think he is? And they saw all the big crowds following him. And they got jealous of him. And they said, we got to kill him. Plus, he said he was God. Oh, we got to kill this guy. He's got too much going on. Jealousy, envy. That's you. Let me tell you something. If someone's jealous of you because of your faith, praise God. That means your faith must be pretty real. But if your non-Christian friends are looking at you and saying, you know what? They ain't got nothing I ain't got. That's pretty sad. They're just like me. They deal with stuff just like me. They start cursing a storm when stuff don't go right. They get all drunk when stuff don't go. They do the same thing just like me. What's the difference? But if they look at you and go, wait a minute. That dude just is overcoming some serious pressure right now, and they're still happy. They're praying for me. They're encouraging me. They're either going to get envious or they're going to, in, in a good way, where they want what you have, or they're going to get envious in a bad way. This is a bad way. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man or the non-Christian man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. They can't understand. You can't expect your non-Christian friends to understand spiritual things. But that can't prevent you from being spiritual. That can't prevent you from saying, I pray God does this for me. Oh, God did this for me and thinking they're going to look at you like you're crazy. They are because they can't understand it. But that has nothing to do with what the truth is. So you should say, hey, if they're envious, if they're if they jealous, if they resent me, if they don't like me, ah, am I going to want to please man versus God? No, I got to please God. I got to please God. Look at the next thing says in verse 45. It says, contradicting and blaspheming, they oppose the things of God. They oppose the things that they were spoken by. Galatians 5, 16, 7 says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh. Walk according to what the Bible says, according to how the Holy Spirit guides you, and you won't fulfill the desires of your carnal nature. Okay, and then it says, for the carnal nature or the flesh or our humanness desires and lust and wars against the spirit. In other words, God's saying do this and you're saying do this. There's a little, little angel over here telling you to do one thing and a little demon over here telling you to do that thing. However you understand it, this is what's going on every day with everybody, with kingdoms, with religions, with countries, the devil and the God fighting. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord does Christ have with the devil? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God, which is you, with idols? God and the devil have nothing in common and they never will. So when you are separated to God, you need to say, Lord, separate me from everything that you don't agree with, whatever those things are. And you will find yourself being separated from some of the simplest things that your friends will think are crazy, like watching television shows, like listening to different kinds of music, like eating certain kinds of food, like reading certain kinds of magazines, wearing certain kinds of clothes. Some of the clothes y'all wear, y'all got to stop wearing them. I can tell you that now. Some of y'all come here dressed like you going not to church. I don't want to say where it is, but it ain't good. And you need to say, Lord, how do I look? <laughs> you don't look good. You don't look good. God is going to separate you from that. He's going to separate you from that. But the, the flesh is going to say, no, I want to show a little more of that. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cover those up. <laughs> on October 1st, we're going to do a series. It's either going to be five or six weeks on sexual purity and dating and marriage. And we're going to get into all the good stuff. Y'all think this place is full now? There's <laughs> a war. I was at a camp all week last week in Seattle, and at the, it was a family camp with a church, kids and adults, and I spoke to the kids and adults. And the night I spoke to the adults, a young man, uh, not a young man, an older gentleman came up to me and says, I am a professor of human 
evolutionary biology. I said, run that by me again. <laughs> I am a professor of human evolutionary biology. I says, and he ran off some stuff, and I kind of didn't catch what he was saying. I says, let's back up. Let's start from the beginning. Are you saved? He says, yes. I said, you believe in the Bible? He says, yes. He says, I don't, I'm not a professor anymore. I had to quit. Because evolution is absolutely ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Now, I want to tell you something. You're going to learn evolution in school? Let me tell you this. Evolution is a theory. It's not a fact. It's a theory. But let me tell you what the theory is based on. The theory is not based on science. It's based on a religion, a philosophy that there is no God. That's what it's based on. The Bible says that a fool says in his heart there is no God. Not his mind. Not his mind. His heart. If you're fighting with somebody that, and being opposed by somebody who is against you, it's not a mental thing. It's a spiritual thing. The Bible says we wrestle against not flesh and blood, but the spiritual powers in the heavenly places. When I was an engineering major at the University of New Haven, <laughs> took a lot of classes, you know, passed some, failed some. And one of the laws of thermodynamics is the second law of thermodynamics, which says that all matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, physical things, are there, they tend towards increased randomness or entropy is the degree of randomness. Let me give you an example. This podium right here, even though it appears to be solid, is not solid. It is atoms, countless atoms that are spaced away from each other and but held together by electrical force. This is an electrical field. That is a fact. This is an electrical field of atoms, but it's not solid. You can pass something through this. Radio waves is an example. It's not a solid thing. You are not a solid thing. You are a bunch of little atoms going, eee. Some of y'all feel like that sometimes? Eee. That's you. So, so these atoms, all these Countless atoms are just going, and if you let this sit here, a house, a building, a person, long enough, by nature, all the atoms will do this eventually. They will move apart. So the second law of thermodynamics says that by nature, all matter moves away from itself and falls apart. That's why you get old, your skin wrinkles. That's why cars fall apart. That's why things, when they get old, they fall apart. Because the atoms on the molecular level are moving away from each other. That is a fact. What evolution says is that somehow this atom and this atom found each other, hooked up, fell in love, and made more. And said, let's make something real complex like people. We'll make an eye, we'll make an ear, we'll make intestines, we'll make a brain that thinks, has emotions. Impossible. If you were walking on the beach with me, okay, we are walking on the beach. And we saw this watch on the floor, on the ground. And I said, oh, look, person who's walking with me on the beach. <laughs> Notice. A product of billions of years of evolutionary science. <laughs> Let us gaze at the wonderment of nothingness and creation and evolution. Look, it has a black plastic band with holes that have a design. It has numbers that I can beep. I can do my pulse. I can do stopwatch, count up, count down. I can do my time in uh, Zulu time. French Greenwich, French Italian time. <laughs> I can beep it forward and beep it backward. It has green and black and gray and metal on the back. This, after billions of years of seaweed, seagull stuff, water, <laughs> sand, crabs, came together, and we have this watch. And you would say, wow, wow, that's deep. It's not deep, it's foolish. This watch is nowhere near as complex as the wrist that it's on. It's not even close. It's not an accident. God 
took these atoms and put them together and designed them and ordered them and formed you in the womb himself. But the philosophy is not a matter of education. It's a matter of spiritual battle. The devil knows. You know why? Because guess what? If you were an an accident and you evolved and there's no God, then there's no absolute law. There's no right or wrong. That means you could do whatever you want. You can kill babies in the womb. You could love who you want, have sex with who you want. Next thing you know, they're going to be, and I don't think we'll ever get this far, but why can't I kill you? Why can't I kill you? If, you, if there's no God, there's no right and wrong, and I can do it, and it's all subjective, I can go to court and prove that killing you was okay. It's all the devil. They're not going to tell you that. You know why? Because they don't even know it. But their heart says, no God. We oppose Christianity. We oppose Jesus Christ. And here's one of the philosophies that the devil created. Absolutely. Absolutely. The next thing it says in verse uh, 50, look at verse 50. It says, but the Jews stirred up devout prominent men and women. They're going to be jealous of you. They're going to oppose you. They're going to come against you. And they're going to stir up other people against you. I was in a, on a show eight years ago with Peter Jennings called Growing Up in a Town, Growing Up in the World of AIDS. This is when AIDS was a big thing. And it was just starting. And there was 100 people in this room in a circle. It was a town meeting. It was live 90 minutes on national television. And they gave eight people microphones. I was one of them. Big mistake. And I was there as a Christian, representing a Christian point of view. Dr. Dobson was there, representing a Christian point of view. And then you had the gay community representing their point of view, Planned Parenthood, the CDC, teenage, just all these people. And it was very tense, you know, it was live television, everybody's nervous, you know, da 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 And I'm sitting there, you know, of course, I've got all my, my answers, my verses, boom, 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 and I'm probably going to get one opportunity. Well, they gave me an opportunity. They gave Dr. Dobson an opportunity. He spoke for like 15 seconds. The whole, it, they just kind of, that was all they gave him. But as the time was going by, I was watching my watch. And I was like, you know what? There's probably about three more commercials, and this show's going to be over. And I'm only going to have said something one time. I got a lot more I want to say. <laughs> and they gave me a microphone. And you know what? If I start talking, they can't stop me because it's live. You know what I'm saying? They can't go, excuse me, huts, cut. Now, Ms. McPherson, we haven't called on you. Now, we're going to try this again. They can't do that. The whole country's watching this. Everyone's into A's. And if I open my mouth, everybody's going to hear my mouth. <laughs> so I'm just waiting. I'm like, oh, yeah. this. Is. And, you know, I'm watching. I'm, like, wanting to talk. I went all the way to New York for, you know, I want to talk. So, they, you know, they're giving their little opinions about this little safe sex thing, the condom thing, all the stuff they're talking about. And so my time came, and I don't remember what I said, but it was loud. I said, excuse me, uh, uh, Peter Jennings, I disagree with so-and-so from the CDC. Boom, 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 boom. And, of course, he wasn't expected, so he was like, uh, uh, he had to kind of make it look like it was natural. Uh, yes, uh, Miles McPherson from, uh, da, da, da. yes, what would you say? Ba, da, 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 da. I disagree with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay. A few minutes later, um, Peter Jennings. Uh, <laughs> and then this teenage girl started getting me, well, and I said, nah, and it went, bah, 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 bah. and Peter was like, uh oh, this is, you know, this is, this is getting heated. Well, after it was over, I, everyone was, you know, patting themselves on the back. They were on TV, you know, they didn't make this great show, da, da, da. and I'm standing there. And all the demons started to come. All these people surrounded me and cursed me out for like an hour. And I'm like, okay, part two. <laughs> I ain't, you know, I ain't, I'm not, I'm not backing down. So they're like, who do you think you are? You, you, you and that Dobson guy. Y'all, who do y'all think y'all are coming here? I said, who's who? The Bible says, ba da 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 Well, who do you think it is? ba da da ba da da ba da da ba da da They were all around. I am not lying. I'm not exaggerating. I wish I had a video. Matter of fact, God, I think I would like to watch this when I get to heaven. Is that okay? <laughs> it was like this. I was like, ba da da ba da da ba da da I had to go 360 on them. For an hour, 
for an hour. This girl comes to me, teenage girl. She says, you know what? You don't know how to talk to teenagers. Teenagers are not going to listen to you. You just, da, 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 da. I was like, girlfriend, I talk to more kids you've ever seen in your life. Get out of my face. <laughs> I was a newly saved kind of brother. So I was kind of, you know, ridiculous. So we're talking, 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 talking. And they're following me out. <laughs> Who's he thinking? Yeah, that's that guy. He don't hear. He one of them Christian dudes. So I get out. Everyone leaves. I'm in the hallway. And the devil says, you just blew it. You ain't going to ever get invited to do anything in Christmas in public schools. You, you and, and I was like, what? Because I'm now reflecting on what I said. <laughs> and I, didn't say, I just said stuff from the Bible, right? And so the producer of the show comes down. And he says, look, Peter Jennings wants to see you. And he says he's thinking about making you the person of the week. I was like, George Jefferson. I was like, that's right. That's right. So I started, <laughs> I started walking up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he took me in the corner. He's like, listen, Miles, this is, this is, this is what he wants to do. He wants to talk to you. Da, da. They, they didn't make me the person of the week, but I, he did tell me he was thinking about it. So I go up there with my wife. And you know, Peter Jennings, I always looked at him as kind of a conservative square kind of guy. And I did, you know, town, you got the suit on, the conventional, you know, suit, and, you know, no style. And just, you know, <laughs> that brother is so smooth. He is smooth. And I went in there, and he was kicked back and had his little designer socks on. And he was so smooth. We sat there for like an hour talking to this guy. And we're leaving. And he says, Miles, what do you want to do with your life? This was in 1992. And I said, I want every kid in this country to hear what I got to say. I want them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Boom, 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 boom. And he says, I wish you luck. But you know my point is saying this. When you represent God, all the enemies of God will team up against you. It's no big deal. When you've done that, you say, yeah, I must have stepped on a big nerve. I must have really stepped on a big nerve, and I'm ready to fight. Look what the Bible says next. The Bible says in verse 46, Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy to everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Jesus, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible says the penalty of that sin is death. The Bible says that that death is hell. That death is hell. And the Bible says that he who has Christ has life. But he who does not have Christ does not have life. If you accept that, you are what the Bible calls worthy of receiving it. But if you reject it, you judge yourself unworthy. It's not for me to judge whether you're unworthy. It's for you to judge whether you're unworthy. If you want to be chosen by God, choose him. He's, saying, he's like, whoever wants to be saved, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what he says. Not these kind of people, these kind of people, whoever. And guess what? Whenever. Whenever you want. Now, you can wait too long and it could be too late. You can wait too long and it could be too late because what happened here? They said, listen, since you don't want it, we're leaving. We're going to somebody else. Look what the Bible says in verse 50. Look at verse 50. Verse, ver, 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 verse 50. Sorry. The Jews stirred up devout and prominent women and chief men of the city and raised up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. But what they do? They shook off the dust from their feet. They said, we don't even want your dirt. Uh, uh. That's what it says. Let me, let me, let me. In Matthew verse 10, 11, this is what Jesus says. Whatever city or town you enter, inquire, in, inquire who in that city is worthy and stay there in the house until you go out. When you go into the household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it, the peace of God through you. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Whoever will not receive my words, uh, Whoever will not receive you nor your words when you depart from that place or city, shake off the dust from your feet. You want to be worthy of God's love? Receive it. Now, does he love you? Yes. Are you someone who is worthy in the sense that you're a candidate to receive it? Yes. But you are not automatically a Christian because in your mind you're good. You have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart 
that he raised God from the dead and receive his love. And then you are going to in turn share his love. But the first thing you got to do is by faith receive his love and receive his forgiveness. But if you don't want it, he will take it to somebody else. They just go somebody else. They say, we came to you first, but since you don't want it, we'll go over here. That's fine. That's fine. And many of you have people in your life, they don't want to hear the word of God. Guess what? Move on to somebody else. Move on to somebody else. Don't waste your time. And I want to qualify that statement. Don't be consumed arguing with somebody when you could be sharing the gospel with somebody else who wants to hear it. It doesn't mean you don't keep praying for them. It doesn't mean you don't keep loving them and encourage them. But you're not going to argue salvation into someone's head. You're going to have to pray it into their heart. But there are people out there who were just waiting. I want to hear the good news. Does God love me? Let me tell you something. God loves you. There's somebody here tonight. You came here, and if you died, when you walked in this room, you would go to hell. You've been through some stuff. You're discouraged. Your sin is dragging you down. God wants you to know he loves you, and he wants to, you, he wants to forgive you tonight. But if you don't want it, fine. He ain't going to chase you. But if you want it, he says, look, I'll give you salvation. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Because there's going to come a day when you can't find him. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And guess what? God will have mercy on you. You know what the Bible says? That God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you think you're all that, God's going to give you the Heisman. Bam. He's going to resist you. But if you say, God, I want you, God will say, that's good. That's good. In your life and in your witnessing and in your ministry, look for the people who are receptive and don't get tripped out in the people who don't receive you. Because let me tell you something, those bad experiences will turn into good experiences. I was at a high school once, and I was do an assembly, and assembly's like 40 minutes, and I just started the assembly, and this kid was talking, so I stopped talking. And I looked at him, like, I'm up here talking. And, in the, and I waited a second too long, and this one kid over here said, boo! Then another kid over here said, get off the stage! Then they stood up and started doing this, like at the Apollo. Boo! Get off the stage! Like, get out of here! Eh? All over the room. I had a microphone in my hand like this. I literally went like this. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Make a long story short, the assembly, I ended up recovering. The assembly went well. And about 56 kids got saved. This was like five years ago, and I still remember this thing. But a Muslim kid was my escort the whole day in that school. And he took me around. When kids would come talk to me, he would say, back off. You only got one question. And he was just like... He hung out with me the whole day. And you know, all these kids got to say, what turned out to be a bad thing ended up to be a good thing. The devil is going to intimidate you from doing his work with these little scary situations that never end up being as bad as they think, as you, as you think. You have to go do it. Your homework, for all you who got notes and you're taking notes, here's your homework. Face your fears. Pick out the one thing that God has been telling you to do that you have not done because you're scared of persecution. Face your fears and say, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to share the gospel with this person. I don't care what they think. I'm going to jam this person up for telling uh, uh, bad jokes or whatever they're doing in the name of righteousness, and I'm not going to care what they say. Do it. You want to grow in the Lord? Start overcoming your obstacles. Some of you in here need to be saved. If you died today, you would go to hell. Because you have judged yourself unworthy because you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. Coming to church is not the answer. It's surrendering your life that he can separate you to himself. So in a minute, we're going to pray. And if you want to receive Christ as your Savior, that he can transform your life, you're going to have an opportunity. Please don't worry about your image. You got no image with God. You may be cool with the knuckleheads around you. They may think, oh, yeah, he's cool. He ain't, you know, I, I can't stand up and, you know, my image, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm too cool. Don't worry about that, please, because that image will send you to hell. You'll be walking into hell all cool. <laughs> and then when you get to the door, it's going to be so hot, you're going to be like, I'm sorry, God. Too late, brother. Too late, sister. Oh, I can't, you know, I can't get saved. I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm cool. Me and God are cool. 
you and God ain't cool. Your sin killed his son. So until you get saved, he's mad at you. He's mad at your sin. But he loves you. And he wants so bad for you to receive the truth. But he's not going to make you. So in a minute, we're going to pray. If you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, you ask him by faith and you receive his salvation. If you don't, then you judge yourself unworthy. Let me read one more verse to you, then I'm gonna, we'll do this. Hebrews 2 is a good verse. For the word, for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression or sin received a just reward, if God is really God and his gospel is true and people really go to hell, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If, if you are on your way to hell and your only hope is Jesus Christ and he did die for your sin, which is a historical fact, and he did rise from dead, which is a historical fact, and you reject that, how are you going to not be punished? How? It's like my kids do something I tell them don't do. I got to punish them. I got to punish them. And they look me in the eye. Watch this, Dad. Oh, no, it's on now. <laughs> it's on. You can't just do that and expect me not to do. If I don't do something, I'm not being a good dad. You know, people say God is a God of love. Guess what? God is a God of wrath, too. God is a God of wrath. He is. So if you want Christ to be your Savior, in a minute we're going to pray. Guess what? He wants to be your Savior. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much that all the things we're scared of, they're so small if we see them through your eyes. Lord, I thank you that you forgive sin. You indeed forgive sin. Lord, I pray for this church, the people who call this dead church, that they will be committed to the mission. They will be committed to serve. And when the devil tries to scare them out of serving, they will realize that's just part of the deal. They will follow you by faith. They wouldn't worry about what people think. They wouldn't worry about their lifestyle becoming one that's going to make them unhappy. They would just know you're faithful. And you're always going to call us to do the right thing. But, Lord, there may be somebody here today. They have judged themselves unworthy up until this point because they have rejected the gospel. They have judged themselves unworthy because they have snubbed the gospel, ignored it. But today they want to receive it. They don't want you to dust, wipe the dust off your feet and walk away from them. They want you to love them and forgive them. So if you would like Jesus to be your Savior, come live in your heart to forgive you of your sin. Pray this prayer with me. And as you pray, you must believe that Jesus is real, that he loves you. And that he anxiously wants to forgive you and be your God. In the privacy of your heart, pray, dear God, I'm a sinner, I know. I've ignored you. But I want to accept you today. I believe that Jesus is the Lord that he died and rose from the dead. Please forgive me, Jesus. Please come live in my heart and be my Savior, my Messiah. I surrender my life to you. Thank you, Jesus. 
as all of our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer to ask Jesus to be your Savior, just stand up to your feet right now and acknowledge that prayer. Anybody in this room? You ask God to forgive you of your sin. God bless you. Stay standing, please. God bless you. Stay standing. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You asked God, and he forgave you. Now he wants you to acknowledge that. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Good. Doesn't matter where you sit. Doesn't matter who you came with. Please don't worry about those people you came with. Worry about God. That's it. God bless you. Good. Good. God has called you. He has told you, I want to love you. I want to forgive you. I want to transform your life. Let me. Please let me. Stay standing, please. God bless you. Good. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. God bless you. Good. Come on, little girls out there. You're 25, 26. You think you're cute? You're God's little girl. That's all you are. God wants your life. Stand up to your feet. Give him your life. He'll bring you your man. He'll bring you love. He'll bring you everything you need. He knows what you need. Fellas out there, don't try to be cool. There's no such thing as being cool with God. God is cool. Give your life to Jesus. Be a man and surrender your life to Christ. And be a man of God. Stand to your feet. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. God bless you. Good. Good. Anybody else? Good. Now I'm going to ask all you people who are standing to do one more thing. Not to sit down. I'm going to ask you right now as we welcome you to the family of God to come right down here to the altar. Right to me. Come shake my hand. Come on right down here. Right here. God bless you. Stay right there. God bless you. Face this way. This way. God bless you. Come on down here right now. Come on. Come on. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Come on. How you doing, State? San Diego State girl. What's up, man? How you doing? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All right. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Stay right here. God bless you. God bless you. All right. God bless you. God bless you. All right. God bless you, man. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All right. Come on now. Come on. All your sin is gone. All the stuff is gone. Now you belong to God. He just separated you from your old life. He separated you from your friends, your boyfriends, your girlfriends, your parents, your family. He, you belong to him now. He is going to teach you how to live. You have to listen to him. If you don't listen to him, your life won't get any better. It won't get any better. It might get worse. Because now the devil is going to, he, he's going to turn up his heat on you. You got to obey God. This is the first day of the rest of your life. You just joined a whole new family. Now you got to play by their rules. Here are the rules right here. Not my opinion, this book right here. What we want to do is help you learn the book. That's it. You do what the book says. rest of your life, all you got to do is do what the book says. Very simple. Or whatever your issues are, God knows. He can handle them. Amen? A lot of them are saying amen, but they don't believe it either. <laughs> amen? Amen. See, it's even louder. Because we're all still trying to figure it out and, you know, deal with it. Got temptations here, temptations there. Oh, God, please help a brother out. So you got to say every day, help a sister out. I don't know how to do this. You don't know how to live life. We don't know how. We got to walk by faith. And God is going to lead you to do stuff that makes zero sense to people and all sense to him. And then you're going to see, wow, and that's the trick. Can you take the step of faith, not understanding, not knowing, going, God, I'm just trusting you, but I know this is what you want me to do, and go, whew, then he shows you. But he ain't going to show you first. That's not faith. He's going to show you after. Amen? All y'all out there, this week, find somebody. Find somebody or this thing that God's calling you to do, and by faith, go do it. I've been telling you about the building. Did I talk about that this service? I'm kind of, this is my third time. Keep praying about that. I'm sorry. God loves all y'all. We want to take y'all in the back and give you a book. If these are your friends, we're going to take them right in the back. And uh, we're going to give you a little book that I wrote to help you learn how to read the Bible. Read the book. Okay? Read the book. Every day for 21 days, and you'll learn how to read the Bible. Amen? We're going to pray for them, and then they're going to walk out. We mentioned that we're starting small groups, or we're having a training on September 16th. Men... We need men to step up 
and be false small group facilitators. We need men to step up and be small group facilitators. Ladies, we're starting a women's ministry. We need ladies to step up and minister to these young ladies out here. So you could tell them the stuff that I can't say from the pulpit. Amen? Like, girlfriend, get a brain. <laughs> get a blanket. <laughs> Put it around your shoulders. Okay? We ladies, y'all well, need to say that to them. Because I can't say that stuff. I can, but I, you know. In college ministry, we need to have ministry on this campus and all these campuses in, in this city. We need to get people say, pray for the building. Let's pray for these people. Lord, bless these people. Change their life. <sighs> change their life. Lord, change our life. Lord, we don't want to be churchgoers. We want to be warriors for you. We want to be useful for you. As a church, as individuals, we want to be useful. We want to help people get to know you. May we be obedient to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you move, how many people here for the, from the first day? Raise your hand. Okay, many of you here the first day. And the first day I mentioned that we were not going to be a church. That was a big crowd. And that we were going to help people. I was watching television the other day. These four guys got out of prison, and they tracked them to see how long it would take for them to get back into what they were doing. And they walked out of prison with $50, one bag of their belongings, nothing. And three out of the four guys fell back into what they were doing. And I'm sitting there with my wife watching this, and I'm going, you know what? This is ministry right here. Ministry is not talking to y'all. I mean, that is ministry, but that's not the extent of this church. It's helping people. Then I watched trauma. You ever watch trauma? People come into hospitals and they're shot. This one guy was shot and they had to cut his chest open and massage his heart. And I actually saw that in real life. I went to an ER. My friend was at the ER and, I, and, and guy got shot in his heart. They cut his heart, chest open, separated his ribs and grabbed his heart. And I was standing right there. He ended up dying. But you know what? People out there are hurting. Some of y'all... You're hurting, but some of y'all are just babies. Just babies. You got everything you need, but you're just yang, 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 whining to God. God's like, let's go help somebody and stop whining and complaining. Y'all know who I'm talking about? You know who you are. Let's not be the church where you go to this church, then you go to this church, you go to this church, and all you do is whine and complain. Go to a church and say, God, use me. Humble yourself and be committed. Serve be accountable, and walk with Jesus the right way. Now, some of y'all been lost, saved long enough, you need to go out there and sign up and be a small group facilitator with your man, woman, wherever from, whatever. Go out there and get involved. And if you're not mature enough and they tell you, go to the small group and get mature enough. But don't come to church and just watch. This is not a show. It may be entertaining, but it ain't a show. It truly is not a show. So let's, 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 let's get ready to do some work. There's a Luther Vandross song. I like uh, begging music. Begging music is, oh, baby, please, please, please. You know, I like that kind of music. I sing it to my wife. <laughs> I love you, you're my, you know, whatever. So there's one song that's called, If This World Was Mine. You know, I would do this for you. I, so I sing it to the world. If this world was mine, I, da, da, da. I'm singing in the car. And I started thinking. God said, well, what if I gave you the world? What would you do? Would you be ready to change the world if I gave it to you? I was like, yeah, huh. I guess I wouldn't. You know, God wants to bless you, but you ain't ready. He has all these blessings he wants to give to you, all this responsibility, all this opportunity. But if he gave it to you, you mess it up. That's why we have to learn the Bible. That's why we have to walk with God a little bit at a time. And then he's going to give you stuff that's going to be a blessing. That's what it's all about. He's got it. More stuff than you could ever imagine. You'll never figure out all the blessings God has for you. But all you got to do is get ready to receive it and get ready to manage it. Be a good steward. Give it away. Share it with people that you like and people that you don't like. That's it. Because it ain't yours anyway. It'll never be yours. It'll never be yours. God gives and God takes away. So all y'all, go out there and sign up and say, listen, it's time for me to step up. I'm talking to you, man. Because if the church has strong men, the church is going to be strong. In October... 
I'm speaking at the Promise Keepers in L.A. I told you this before. And the men will go on to the forum. We'll go on as a group of men. And I'm going to be talking trash about y'all. Y'all going to be sitting up there. I'm saying, that's my church up there. Hey, the Rock. <laughs> Anne Graham Lotz, Billy Graham's daughter, speaking here at the sports arena. My wife is heading up the women's ministry. We're going to go take all the women over there. And then we're going to have women's ministry. And we're going to do ministry. Oh, yeah, we'll have our little Bible studies. We'll talk about our issues. Why? So we can go help somebody. I gave about, we cleaned out our closets. We gave all these clothes to these ministry that we have here at the church for people in Mexico. They build houses and give all these clothes. And I was taking these bags out of my car. And this pastor, one of our pastors here at the church, was saying, you know, thank you for the clothes. Thank you for the clothes. And I was like, man, thanking me? This is a blessing. I says, I can't wait till I can ask all of y'all to clean out your closets. Imagine all the shoes, the zapatos. <laughs> right? All the uh, pantalones. All the sweaters and the hats and the whatever else you give. Imagine the tons, the tons. What they, they had a drug bust yesterday. 25 tons of cocaine. And the drug dealer was smiling. They were arresting him. 25 tons. Was it 50 billion? I don't know how many billions of dollars it was, street value, and whatever it was. I'm thinking, man, why can't the church give 25 tons of love? 25 tons of food, clothes, every day. That's us. That's us. There's people here that I was talking to in the, in the first service. They work at a receiving home for kids in the foster care system. Polinsky Center. And I says, let's put a ministry together where we can love those kids. Would y'all give books for little kids who don't have a home? Would y'all give clothes for little kids? Would you go there and pray with them? <laughs> it's a, a no-brainer. You know what Jesus says? I have come to help the least of these. That's who I come for. The least of these. So go out there and sign up. Let's step up. And let's be a church that is ready to do damage in this city and this world. Let's pray for them. Then we're going to take y'all out. And if all y'all over there cannot move, let them walk down the aisle so we don't lose anybody. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for being big. Awesome. Lord, thank you for giving us chance after chance after chance to walk with you faithfully, to do what you want us to do. Lord Jesus, I know so many people here are missing out on so many blessings because they won't trust you. I pray they would trust you this week and receive a blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Walk that way, y'all. Please make a left turn. Follow that brother right there. Walk that way. Please don't move. Walk that way. Come on, let's, let's uh, clap for them a little better than that. Yeah. Yeah. God bless you. Go get a CD or a shirt or a hat in a bookstore and have a nice week. Amen. Go witness to somebody on campus that listened to the Tracy Chapman concert. So go over there and share the gospel with somebody.